Thank you, Aaron, for that lively and energizing piece. I'm Lindsay Russell. As senior class secretary, I'd like to say that this position has been a privilege. The administrators and teachers have pushed me to get out of my comfort zone and be the best student I could be. My peers have helped me form into an individual who, I, um, who I'm proud of, and my fellow officers have helped me grow to be a better leader. At this time, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker. David, David Gore, George Brooke has been a speaker, teacher, life coach, and best-selling author for over 25 years. Known as That Gratitude Guy, he is a keynote speaker for many service organizations, business associations, and chamber of commerce. He is a former Nordstrom store manager and has managed in the corporate world for over 30 years. His published books include the, da the Bro Broker's Daily Gratitude Journal, Happiness Starts with Gratitude, and Gratitude Nuggets to Chew On. With over 400 gratitude videos on YouTube, thousands have seen his message, and he is now considered a leader authority on gratitude and how living a life of gratitude can enhance and improve your life and lead to success. He is quoted as saying, my lifelong quest has been to help people obtain the level of fulfillment and happiness they are capable of reaching. I have the real life experience to draw upon when encouraging individuals to never give up. Please welcome Mr. David George Brooke. Thank you, Lindsay. I'd like to take you back to uh, June of 1968. I'm 18 years old. I'm sitting in the Coliseum Arena, Seattle Center Arena. And I've got my little diploma rolled up in my hand. There's about 550 of us graduating from Queen Anne High School. So I walk out to my car after it's done and we wave goodbye to people and I thought to myself, gosh, and number one, I wonder how many of these people I'm ever gonna see again. But I also had a plan for my whole life that kind of developed over the next couple of years. And I realized later that plan didn't quite work out. And I realized that in many ways, I kind of came to think that maybe the success you have in your life is from the plan that you get versus you thought you get, thought you were going to get rather, and how you dealt with it. And I thought to myself, well, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask people, what would I have liked to know at 18 that I know now, now know at 64? So I started asking people and I got some really interesting comments. It's never too late was something that came up a lot. Of course, this is all with the benefit of hindsight. Be teachable, never stop being a student. Here we have all these young men and women graduated and in some cases they're going on to college, in other cases they think this is the end of the line when really, in fact, it's really only the beginning of our learning if we learn for our entire lives. Seek out a mentor, another comment I heard a lot. Don't party as much. That kind of cracked me up a little bit. I'm sure there's some people that thought that maybe they wasted some time doing that. Be present, time flies. Boy, do I know that, that was 45 years ago. It seems like just a couple of years ago. Set goals, another one, very, very common. In fact, I read this recently, a dream written down with a date becomes a goal. A goal broken down into steps becomes a plan. A plan, by, excuse me, a plan backed by actions makes your dreams come true. I thought it's really true because a lot of people talk and a lot of people don't always act. I also highly recommend having a bucket list. It wasn't called that way back when, when I started. But I always had that list of the things I wanted to do at some point before I passed on. Another common thread, understand your finances. Somebody said to me, what if I had just put away 10% of everything I'd ever made? What would I have? Good point. When you get a problem, receive it like a gift. I think in so many ways, life is like this. It's ups and downs. This is where everybody wants to be. This is not fun, they want to get back here again, but that's where the lessons are learned. You will fail, it'll be part of the process. Another one that people told me a lot. It's gonna be part of it, you're gonna learn from it, as I just mentioned. Always have a plan B, that was kind of a common thread. Stop worrying, it's wasted energy. And finally, find your passion and find your joy. It took me 45 years to find my passion, which I'm going to talk about in a second, about gratitude. But I will tell you, with all those great comments, that's, what not, that's not what I would have said. Mine would have been four words. Be grateful and never quit. If somebody had told me that back there in 1968, I think it would have helped me over some of the hurdles and different obstacles and challenges that I had to find. And when I talk about not quitting, I think about the things that happened to me. My wife, unfortunately, passed away. 
And we had two sons. Connor was four at the time and Kyle was 14. And I'd had a lot of loss prior to that. My mother and father and friends and buddies in Vietnam and so forth. And at some point I thought, boy, if I'm going to raise Connor and Kyle, I better set a very good example about never quitting and understanding gratitude, which in so many ways has to do with appreciating what you have versus what you don't have. But Connor really struggled. He was four when Dana died, as I mentioned, and I went to school and they said, he's not right. I said, you know, his mother just died a few months ago. Yeah, but he's messed up. You're going to have to hold him back, and I had to hold him back first grade twice, and he had all these special programs. But through all this, I kept saying, Connor and Kyle, we can't give up. Your dad can't give up. Our mom is left. So you're going to hang in there, and I'm going to set a good example for you. But both of those sons of mine really, really tried. But Connor said, I want to play baseball. And he just tried and tried. And they said, he'll never make it in sports. He'll never make it in life. These counselors are kind of rough on me. But Connor kept showing up. He kept coming back. And he started playing t-ball. How many people here have kids that play t-ball? Again, probably the majority. Well, here's the thing I don't understand. When you hit the ball at t-ball, the ball doesn't move. It just sits here. And here's Connor. He's just swinging away. And he's swinging way up here. Connor, the ball is down here on the tee. That's where you're supposed to hit it. So he keeps lowering his swing. Finally, he goes too low. He hits the tee, knocks the ball. It falls forward. He goes, Dad, I got a hit. <laughs> Went about three inches. But he kept trying. He kept hanging in there, hanging in there. He played. We went through four or five more years. He was probably 11 years old. Couldn't run, couldn't throw, couldn't catch, couldn't hit. Other than that, he was not too bad. <laughs> But then we get to May 31st, 2005. He's about 11 years old. And we're in a game up in Kirkland. And it's 7-6, to six, the other team. And there's a guy in second and third. It's the bottom of the seventh. And I think the manager was out of players. Because there was nobody left. And then I look over in the dugout. And who comes out? Connor. So if you can just picture this. He's swinging the bat like he's Babe Ruth. I'm going, Connor, you have a hard time with a bunt. And then he looks, looks, Dad, I'm up. Now, what child talks to their parents that are in the stands? But I appreciate the fact he's up there and he's just swinging like crazy. So, guy in second and third, as I mentioned, and two out. Full count. The next pitch comes in. Connor rips it down the left field line. Goes just inside the bag. The guy from third comes in. The guy from second rounds comes in to home. The ball, the guy, the catcher all come together. They catch, he catches the ball, the ball pops out. And they win the game 8-7. to seven. And here is Connor standing out in second base. Dad, I got a hit! <laughs> the entire dugout walks out and puts Connor on their shoulders and carries him off the field. I remember that moment like it was five minutes ago. And when we got home that night, I said, Connor, it was never about baseball. It's about the fact you just never gave up. And I so admired that in him, and I admired that in Kyle. And as I say with those four words, be grateful and never quit, they are words to live by. I didn't even understand gratitude until a little bit later in life and understand why it was so important. But I also understood some really, really neat life lessons that had been learned from people that were, had been around a little bit longer than I had. I wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself and not the life others expected of me. One of the great lessons these people that had been in their 80s mentioned to me. I wish I hadn't worked so hard. All of you young people are headed out into lives and careers and so on. But you'll never hear anybody say, I wish I would have worked more when they get later in life. I wish I'd had the courage to express my feelings. Another interesting thing. I wish I had stayed in touch with my friends. As you get older in life and people pass on and people go different directions, friends become maybe even more important than they are now. And the last one I found really, really powerful, I wish I had let myself be happier. When John Lennon was five years old, his mother said, John, I'm going to tell you right now, the most important thing you are going to want to find in your life is happiness, to be happy. John Lennon thought, okay, so a few years later he's in school, and the teacher's looking around at the different students. She says, John, what do you want to be when you grow up? He says, happy. The teacher looks at John and says, you don't understand the assignment. John Lennon looks at the teacher and goes, you don't understand life. 
Of course, that's kind of typical John Lennon. But I thought it was really great. And I guess as I mentioned through the ups and downs of life, I've never found anybody that really did truly get that plan they thought they were going to get. But I got a lot of people that dealt with the plan they did get. And so I realized you're going to need some tools along the way. And somebody suggested to me one day, they said, have you ever gotten a gratitude journal? you understand the gratitude journal? I did not know what that was. But I understood a lot about gratitude and, again, focusing on what you have versus what we don't have. We live in a world, sadly, that focuses so much on what we don't have. So when I talk about embracing gratitude, I think a lot of it comes down to how we look at something. It's very, very key. So I'd like you to all stand up if you'd be so kind. And I just want you to do something that we haven't been here very long, but just take your right arm and I just want you to stretch it out and start turning in a clockwise manner. Now I understand we're in a digital age here, so if anybody's not certain of which way, there's a watch. And just start turning in a clockwise manner, stretch it as far as you can, that always feels good. Now keep it going clockwise. Now just start bringing it slowly down. The top of your head, forehead, eyes, shoulders, chest, stomach. Which direction is it going now? Who said that? Bueller? Anybody? I think it's going counterplay. Okay, sit down. Thank you. I didn't have a glass I could say that was half full or half empty, so I figured that would work pretty well. But it does depend on how you look at it. I have many, many reasons why I could go around being depressed and having a really tough time in life. I had a lot of losses. I mentioned my wife and mom and dad and friends, and there's a lot of things I wouldn't even bore you with. But I will tell you, it's a choice that you make. Happiness is a choice. John Lennon talked about happiness and wanting that to be his goal in life. Gratitude is a choice when you focus on what you have versus what you don't have. So I talk a lot about embracing gratitude, but I also talk about it takes as long as it takes. I wanted to be a speaker when I was 19 years old. I graduated from high school and I went over to this other high school when I was a freshman at the University of Washington. He said, I'd like you to speak for this group. I said, okay. And then when I went back to my car, I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. I want to be a speaker. Well, I didn't really attack this until about two years ago. And that took me 42 years to get that together. But you know what? It doesn't matter. When I get to look at eyes of every single person in this audience or any other group I'm fortunate enough to speak to, it's your journey. It doesn't matter if you're young, old, or older, a word I'm using now more, or wherever you are in this continuum of life, it's your journey. It's so unique. And when you embrace gratitude and focus on what you have versus what you don't have, it makes it a lot easier to navigate. Third thing is that you got to get the junk out of your brain. You've got to get rid of the junk and make room for gratitude. I go by these cul-de-sacs every so often and I see these garages, which I believe are designed for cars. And they're just floor to ceiling boxes. It just cracks me up. And I, they have a space like this big and they kind of go like this to like get into their garage. It's junk. People are always driving over things, literally or figuratively in their lives, picking it up, putting it in front of them and driving over them again. I was in a workshop a while ago and this young lady said, well, you know, I've really had it with my ex-husband because he's kind of a piece of... <clears throat> and I said, well, that's too bad. When did you get divorced? 1997. So you're still hanging on to that. You've got to get rid of that stuff. And when you go back out to those cars today, notice that your windshield is about this deep, two feet maybe, maybe five feet wide. And then notice how big the rear view mirror is. It's pretty small. Mostly you want to focus on what's in front of you, learn a little bit and pay attention to what's behind you. If you look in there and you see some flashing blue lights, pull over. <laughs> Don't want to get in trouble. But mostly focus on what's in front of you. Baccalaureate, commencement. Remember thinking when I was in my commencement at Queen Anne High School, as I mentioned, what's up with that? That's starting. Oh, I see. I thought I was finishing. But really, I was just starting. It's mostly in front of you. And you learn from what's behind you, but use it sparingly and apply it to the future. This gentleman says to me, after Dana had passed away and all these other things had happened, boy, you just are kind of a mess. I said, well, you know, it hasn't been easy, Bob, going through what I've gone through. And I got a gratitude journal one day. I ordered one and I started writing in it. And I noticed a huge difference. I've become a huge advocate. This takes five minutes a day. 
to write in it. Five minutes. I put on the cover here. If you think about it, it's like a dream. If you talk about it, it inspires you. But if you write about it, it empowers you. Now, I'm pretty fortunate to do a lot of schools. And you can imagine the first question is, do you have an app? <laughs> and actually, the funny thing is, I do. I actually do have an app. And you just press the button, you go, I'm so grateful to Becky Schrager for inviting me today. And it just types it. It just types it right on the little phone there, right in the gratitude journal. But it's not quite the same. When we start with a thought in our brain, the CPU up here goes to our heart, our arm, our hand, a pen to the paper. There's something about it that's visceral that you connect. And I saw an article recently, they said even the laptops, even the, the tablets and all this, it's not as good a connection, which is why we still take notes with our pen on our paper and how it seems to really get solid into the brain. You'll really discover a huge difference. This takes, as I say, five minutes a day. It's very, very simple and it's easy and all you're doing is writing down and focusing on what you're grateful for. It's just that simple. So I talk about this when I do more expanded talks and I get into workshops and things that are really fun. But embracing gratitude, it takes as long as it takes. Don't ever, ever, ever give up. That's Winston Churchill originally said that. Get a gratitude journal. Make room for gratitude and clear out the junk in your brain. And the last one is sharing gratitude. You'll notice that anybody that gets excited about something wants to share it. When you get some really good or really bad news, I always think that, that always tells me who my best friend is because that's the first person you call when you get good or bad news. So you want to share it. So I want to just do a little brief exercise speaking of sharing gratitude. How many people here since I've been speaking have been on their cell phones? Anybody? Gosh, this is a phenomenal group. <laughs> I'd like you to all take your smartphones out if you would. Hopefully there's good reception in here. And I'm going to give you 30 seconds to do something. I'm going to put my little timer here. This is called the four T's. Tweet, text, telephone, or tell. The four T's. And most people text. And I want you to text somebody and tell them how grateful you are to have them in your life. And I'll give you 30 seconds and you can go start now. Of course, you'll notice nobody's using the telephone. These were phones at one point. Got 10 seconds. And stop. And you can do that later, or finish it later. Of course, I was going to tell some of the students, hint, you may want to text your parents. <laughs> but I didn't want to be too obvious. I was at a school recently where they had kind of a performing arts center like this, but it went up sort of higher. And I could hear this lady right over here, and she's, she's actually using this as a telephone. It was quite a concept. And she's going, and she must have been talking to her husband. Yes, honey, I just want to let you know how grateful I am for you. And I want to let you know how much I love you. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm very good. I don't know. Some speaker just told me to tell you this. <laughs> I went, no, it's supposed to be your idea. It's not supposed to be my idea. Gosh, you're blowing it. And then somebody else shows me the text. Afterwards, I was talking to them. They go, look, I sent it to her. I'm really grateful for you. She texts back, what's up? <laughs> and another one, what do you need? It was just a reminder to me about how we don't do it probably enough. I went skydiving once and I had eight of my buddies. I made reservations and I was all excited. And then the week before, two of them canceled. And then a couple more canceled. And then the Wednesday before the Saturday, I got a call. <coughs> Dave, <coughs> we're sick. So I walk into Issaquah skydiving. I walk proudly up to the counter and I go, reservations for Brooke. He goes, great, where's your friends? And I went, I don't have any. <laughs> and I went all by myself. I have a little picture that's really super, but it's not the same and you don't get to share it. So I'd ask when you think about where I am at my age and looking back to where all you fine young men and women are that have graduated and I'm very proud of you, even though I don't know any of you, it's a phenomenal accomplishment. If you hear nothing else I say, 
please remember, be grateful and never quit. It'll serve you very well. Thank you so much.
places you'll go. You'll be on your way up, you'll be seeing great sights. You'll join the high flyers who soar at high heights. You won't lie behind because you'll have the speed. You'll pass the whole game and you'll soon take the lead. Wherever you fly, you'll be the best of the best. Wherever you go, you'll top all the rest. It sucks when you don't because sometimes you won't. I'm sorry to say so, but sadly it's true, and hang-ups can happen to you. You can get all hung up in a prickly perch, and your gang will fly on could be left in a lurch. You'll come down from the lurch with an unpleasant bump, and the chances are then you'll be in a slump. And when you're in a slump, you're not in for much fun. A slump in yourself is not easily done. You will come to a place where the streets are not marked, some windows are lighted, but mostly they're dark. A place you could spring with your elbow or shin. Do you dare to stay out? Do you dare to go in? How much can you lose? How much can you win? And if you go in, should you turn left or right? Or right in three quarters or maybe not quite? Or go around back and sneak in from behind? Simple it's not, I'm afraid you will find. For a mind make your effort to make up his mind. You can get so confused that you'll start to break down long little growth at a breakneck in pace, and grind on for miles across weirdish wild space, headed out here for the most useless place. The waiting place. For people just waiting, waiting for a train to go, or a bus to come, or a plane to go, or the mail to come, or the rain to go, or the phone to ring, or the snow to snow, or waiting for a yes or no, or waiting for your hair to grow. People are just waiting. Waiting for the fish to buy, or waiting for wind to fly ahead, or waiting around for the fighting night, or waiting perhaps for their uncle Jake, or the pot of oil, or a better break, or a string of curls, or a pair of pants, or a wave of curls for another chance. Everyone is just waiting. No, that's not for you. Somehow you'll see all that waiting and staying. You'll find the right places where boom bands are playing. With bands of clapping, once more you'll lie back, ready for anything under the sky. Ready because you're that kind of guy. All the places you go, there is fun to be done, there are points to be scored. There are games to be won, and the magical things you can do with that ball will make you the winningest winner of all. Fame. You'll be famous as famous can be, with a whole wide world watching you on TV. Except when they don't, because sometimes they won't. I'm afraid that sometimes you'll play lonely games too, because games you can't win because you'll play against you. All alone. Whether you like it or not, the love will be something you'll be quite lost. And when you're alone, there's a very good chance you'll meet things that scare you right out of your pants. There are some down the road between hither and yon that can scare you so much you won't want to go on. But on you'll go, though the weather be foul. On you'll go, though your enemies come. On you'll go, though the happy cracks howl. On you're not many, a frightened creep. Though your arms may get sore and your shoulders may leak. On and on you will hike, and I know you will hike far. And face up to your problems, whatever they are. And you'll get mixed up, of course, as you already know. You'll get mixed up with many strange birds as you go. So be sure when you step, step with care and great tact, and remember that life is a great balance act. Just never forget to be dashed and deaf, and never mix up your right foot with your left. And you will and will you succeed? Yes, you will indeed. Ninety eight and three fourths percent guaranteed. Kid, you'll move mountains. So, your name be Bucks Bum or Bixie or Bray, or more K Alley than Alan or Shay. You're off to great places today or today. Your mountain is waiting. So get on your way. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. This is a good secret. Okay. Um, our own Seattle Seahawks head coach, Pete Carroll, is waiting. He's not here. He's not here. <laughs> but he knows how to inspire a team with his words and his actions. His inspirational words apply to our journey through life and the quest for success and excellence as, excellence as we, seniors, venture forward. Always compete by Mr. Pete Carroll. Always compete as you progress through your life. Always compete. If you want to go for it, always compete. You're going to have to make choices in life, and those choices need to be conscious decisions. 
There's only one person in here who can in control here, and that person is you. Always in peace. I lost my place. <laughs> you hold all the cards. You are the master of you. It's time to admit it. You've always known this, so if you're ready, act on it. Always in peace. Don't you dare try to be cool. Don't you dare be afraid of life. Just dare be great. And let it rip. Always be humble. Always be kind. Always be respectful. Always be. Everything you do counts and screams who you are. There is no hiding from you. Act as if the whole world will know who you are. And always be. Be true to yourself and let nothing hold you back. Compete to the greatest you will. Compete to the greatest you and that will always be enough. And that will be a lifetime. Always to be. Mr. Carroll's inspiration to his team and staff shows the determination and drive necessary to be winners, and we as seniors can accomplish great things by remembering these words of wisdom. At this time, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our next guest speaker. He is an incredibly, incredibly accomplished sports photographer. His photographic assignments have taken him through the world covering 16 Super Bowls, five Final Fours, two Olympic Games, and the Goodwill Games in Moscow and Seattle. He is committed to a process of striving for a greater goal in life and to an aspiring to achieve success for the past 36 seasons. He's been, he's been the official photographer for our very own Super Bowl champion of the Seattle Seahawks. Please welcome Mr. Corky Truitt. Super Bowl champions. It is my honor to be here. Nothing happens just because it happens. It happens for a purpose all the time. Coach Terrell has given me the opportunity to improve my skin as a photographer, and I'm 60, and I'm still doing that. I started in 1979, and I had 36 one-year contests, and I love it. I love the opportunity to show why I should still be there. Coach Terrell, when he came on staff, I said, this is spectacular. I get another guy who's a type A person like myself. And he and I have bonded and we have put together a relationship so that I continue to think that my best picture is the one I'm about to take. Because I do not want to live in the past. I want to have a process, a practice, to be the best I can in the next moment of my life. And I do that, and the players love it. They absolutely love the attitude that a six-year-old man will tell them, how are you going to practice today to get better with the process to play the game, to be a professional, and produce? So those are Pete's feet. And my own kind of hearts. Right? Reading, responsibility, respectability, reasonability, rationality, knowing the difference between right and wrong, and then a fair amount of religion. I do not believe I'm just here because it happened. I do believe I am blessed with the opportunity, with all the things that have happened to me, because there were only one set of footprints in the same. And everything that went through my body. It's because of my belief in my Christian faith. And I love it. So much so that he cares. So much so that Pete Carroll started a men's Bible study at the Seattle Seahawks. He buys all the books. We study books every Tuesday. We have a, a new book every, uh, every week. It's the first week we've done it. The staff members and the coaches get together, the players have their own, the women have their own, and he knows that with a strong religious base, a process about our lifestyle, we will be better men and women. Men and women. We are all in, as he says in our office, for one goal, and that goal is to be prepared to do our best, not to win, 
The goal has never been to win the game. It has been to practice the procedure, the process, to be a professional, to play, to be productive. When we went to the Super Bowl, we did not practice against the Denver Broncos. We practiced ourselves to be the best we could be. And look what happened. We are going to practice that same process this year to play against the Green Bay Packers on Thursday night, opening night in the NFL season this year. We will not talk about repeating as Super Bowl champions. That's, that's exciting. We have to prepare our lives each week for the game that is right before us. It has nothing to do with 16 years in the just like your lives. Practice, prepare, to have a process in your core belief to be a professional in what you do. And with that, you can tackle anything. I'm a great team photographer, but I'm not the best yet. I will be better tomorrow. I'll be better the next day. And my players, they are my players at the Seattle Seahawks. They love my professionalism as well as their own players professionalism. The way we practice together, we are unbelievable in our process to be the best we can be. And whether the game goes our way or the other way, that's a whole different thing. But you, as individuals, to prepare your life to be a profession, you may be the best. If you book talked about the line and how you go up, you might keep going up. Sometimes you're going to come down. You get back above your 50-50 line as fast as you can because you prepare. There are going to be things that don't go your way. Just like in football games, we had five games last year. That football karma was on our side, and we won. Any one of those five games we could have lost, but we were so prepared that no amount of adversity, no amount of a bad call, nothing would stop us from our resolve to be a professional at that time to be prepared for success. And it is spectacular. Pete, Pete was walking up the tunnel at the Super Bowl, and he grabbed me. We won the game, and another photographer took a picture. I love this picture. And Pete grabs me. He says, Gordon, we won the Super Bowl for you. <laughs> and everyone else. He probably told that to everyone. Great. <laughs> <laughs> but he knows that I've been there for 36 years, and I have worked my tail. And I love it, and I will work my tail off again. There's no sitting back and saying, wow, we're Super Bowl champions. Sit down. You watch our guys practice right now. It is spectacular. Cam Chancellor said five weeks ago, Corky, I don't care who leaves the team. I don't care who goes somewhere else. God bless them and have a great career. I am more concerned about who comes in to fit our mold so that we can continue to prepare. And that is spectacular. The, uh, the opportunity to be a, a professional and to uh, have a lot of hard work. I told the people who asked me to be here, and I said, I want two names, just like our football team would say Earl Thomas on defense, Russell Wilson on offense. Mm -hmm. They work the hardest, and everyone tries to work with them, and that's what we're great. So I wanted two names of uh, what your classmates thought who would be a man and a woman, student, who worked the hardest. And I have a gift for them. And if they're not here, so what, they still get it. But this is my own mural of the Super Bowl, of my pictures of, we make a winning mural that's 10 feet wide, similar to this, after every win, and it hangs in our locker room. And it goes down as soon as we make another win. So we don't want that sitting up there more than a week. And if it does, the players are annoyed. <laughs> because they have to look at a, a win that was two weeks ago. So there's great motivation in what I do. It's